For the first time in my life I'm truly free To see the click of forest for the poison sea To see the waters occupy the shores of Jersey And I feel alive Right, hello. Hello there. How are you today? I'm good. Coming at you live from my compound, the world's first backer episode for the, Quiet, Cal Fire Crackpots. It is. It is. You know, we want to be prepared for the holidays. We've got busy holidays coming up. We don't want to be caught with our pants now and not releasing an episode and YouTube sending us to the far reaches of obscurity oh, yeah. once again. For those not in the know, we got sent to the gulag in ratings because we missed a single week and YouTube said, you know what, this channel probably doesn't exist anymore. Uh-huh, well, to be fair, we were only a few episodes in. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, like, it's it was kind of hard to tell because the video went from 10 views to, like, 8 or 7 views, and they were like, <gasps> oh, no. <laughs> My stocks are plummeting. We're going, we're, we are, we are um, knee-deep in the slog right now currently in financial turmoil over here at cc headquarters mm -hmm. the youtube slog in which you're uploading with nothing happening i wonder which video is going to be the one that like takes off for no reason if i had to guess it's going to be um what is it episode four intro to golden state water policy that one actually has terrible seo because it's golden state and any of the episodes that say california in them have the highest views oh weird well, yeah, because it's a common term. Like, no one's looking up fucking Golden State. Like, honestly, I kind of... I'm shooting myself in the foot by having, like, the worst SEO episode names ever. It's fine. But we're launching off on our world tour soon enough, and I think one of those episodes is going to finally do it. Yeah, I wouldn't doubt it if that's one of the ones that randomly picks up Steam. Yes, and then that's the only one that ever picked up Steam. <laughs> It's fine. It's you also know, YouTube hates you if you're Creative Commons because they can't make any money off your videos. People go years and years without ever getting any traction. Yes. That might be us. Just might be. Just might be. Well, today we're going to be talking about um, th something that, as I was making the slides, is not really related to the Great Lakes. Water and droughts in the Great Plains in Middle America. This doesn't really have much to do with the Great Lakes, but I wanted to have Great Lakes Part 2. So a sure. little bit. So let's talk about something that, well, I found out once I can get my slides. Yep. Well, what are prairies? Prairies. Wow, we love them. We adore them. What we have 0.1% that we used to of them. Oh, that's no good. Yeah, it's, it's bad. But oh. prairies are still well loved by everyone in the Midwest and people who are very petty about swearing that they have some sort of biodiversity i love how in the in the in northern illinois here where literally it is chicago which is a big slab of concrete and then cornfield all the way to the mississippi there is like one square mile of prairie in like kind of a dense suburb area yep you know where that is right i do it's um yeah. and it still has like power lines and like some roads in there because they were like they were going to develop it it's actually a special type of prairie called a dolomite prairie. Mm. Basically, those are areas where there's so little soil that in some places there's less than a foot of soil before it hits bedrock. So because oh, of that... That's why the developers wanted to build there. Because of that, a lot of those prairie plants end up growing roots that just, you know, go downwards a tiny bit and then bend outwards. And pretty much everything in those prairies is dwarfed versions of what it usually is. Very nice. So if you go out there, the tallest thing is probably going to be some sort of tall grass and maybe only a handful of feet. But like Southern Illinois has nice prairies. There's also some nice forests in Southern Illinois. It's a shame everyone there is so racist. <laughs> such a shame. Yeah, it's it's just such a shame that frequently the most beautiful parts of the country are the most inhospitable. Like Appalachia, beautiful. Like beautiful place. But like as soon as you go into a downtown... And you see, like, some billboard that, like, says no interracial marriage or something like that. You're like, oh, my God. Like, what is this place? That was me spending, what is it, an hour and a half in Kentucky while I was on uh, whatever highway circles around Cincinnati. And there was a Trump convoy that happened to be passing through that day. Nice. My favorite thing that happened in the, the Trump campaign was, you know how, like, when there was a bunch of boats that would hang out in all, like, East Coast harbors that were, like, Trump-repid? 
Oh god, I forgot about that. So yeah. they would frequently swamp each other <laughs> because, like, you had the normal Trump supporters, which had like pretty much no boat, and then like there was the occasional super wealthy one that would just swamp everyone else's boats. Those are um. I was like, that's nice. Those are the people that live in rural areas that still have like front estates, and it's like they like spent a, a million lake, dollars like on them, but they're still deep. dirty Republicans. <laughs> And the lake's like three feet deep and it's all a no wake zone, but they still have one of those boats with like the six engines on the back. Yeah, the no wake zones, and then they're like ripping through it with their jet skis. <laughs> all right. So we talked about this and I was still mad about it. So I thought I'd escaped um, saying that there was a Great Plains region, but basically just taking the middle fourth of America is not the Great Plains region. Do these two pictures look like they, they're in the same geographic region? They do not. Well, they are. This is a big canyon in Yellowstone, so it's like right here, maybe. Why Montana, though, man? Yeah. Montana's, I, um, like, mostly forested. I wouldn't like, put Texas and Oklahoma in. Uh, Texas, I would honestly say they're part of the South, because New culturally Mexico. they want more of that. Like... This is the Southwest. I'm cutting California in half for the Southwest because people who say all of California is part of the Southwest. Actually, they're, it's not true. They're bugging. Oh, man. I don't know, man. I, I don't know. I think, I think there's even a smaller subsection of like Utah, Colorado, Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, and that's the Southwest. Maybe California is just its own entity. You can talk about california as the california region maybe trying to divide things into geographic regions is just pointless and we're getting mad about nothing i think you see we already have 50 distinct regions and they all have their each individual name and even then like bro why is california one state <laughs> like why did california get the most op state geography it has the <laughs> highest and lowest points in the country by like a lot Wow, man, I'm trying to find the metric um, of, yeah, it would be the, um, California would be the 37th most populous country and fifth largest economy. Yeah, fifth if it largest were economy. Country. Like, honestly, but like. Ahead of India and behind Germany. Oh, that's so weird that it's in front of India. I mean, it's, it's the companies, right? Like the, it must like, be. It, like, uh, you know, like $2 trillion, Apple, and probably more than that by now. It must just be an anomaly. Yeah, not Tesla uh, anymore. It's just, like, it could be any state if, like, there were a few more companies there. But, I mean, it's, like, it's yeah. such an agricultural and economic powerhouse that it kind of gets that anyway. It also it's has kind the most of, people. Uh, it also has more people than Canada, which I thought was super interesting. That's, I mean, it just happens. There's weird statistical errors in a bunch of places. Like, the fact that it has a company with a multiple trillion dollar market cap at this point based in it is kind of inflating those numbers a little bit, but... I, I think, think we could easily like, take over Canada. Did you know that Montana is the state with the most supercars registered in it? Yeah. You know why? I, I, know, I know why. It's because this is actually tea. So I had like dinner with some like crazy rich relatives who live in California. And people in Montana hate you if you're from California. Like they're fine if you're a tourist, but they'll always ask you, are you going to live here? Like, like, are you planning on moving here? And if you say yes, boy, they will hate you because what they're doing is after COVID shutdowns, all the rich people would come into Montana and buy like a ton of houses with cash um, and basically destroy any new housing developments made for people in Montana because, hmm. you know, it's kind of desolate. But, but tell me why there's two more supercars there. It's actually because... Montana is one of the few states that has zero sales tax on any sort of car or vehicle. I love and how, like, super depopulated states can just throw that around. And, like, even if they did, it wouldn't matter to them just so people will come there. Yeah. it's. I think that actually is a policy that stems from the, the Bush 2 arc where uh, – <laughs> I believe Being it was Exxon II. paying George W. Bush to, um, it was Exxon paying George W. Bush to lower taxes on SUVs to make them viable still, because okay. SUVs waste massive amounts of gasoline. Yeah, we don't like SUVs on this channel. 
SUV is our public enemy number two, right behind Joe Manchin. Mm-hmm. Man, I am drinking the most bomb hot chocolate I think I've ever made in my life. It's like the um the Simpsons movie Ned Flander kind of hot chocolate. Dude, okay, so I took like Starbucks hot chocolate mix, right? So like already fire. Yeah. Melted a candy cane in it. Mmm. Put brownie batter in it. You're kind of popping off. And then put chocolate chips in it. That's that's a whole bubbling cauldron of hot chocolate. I can feel my blood sugar. I can feel my insulin plummeting right now. Double, double (laughs) toil and trouble. Uh Uh-huh. Whatever that means. It's the witch thing. It's the thing witches say. (laughs) Okay. So part of the thing that makes a plane a plane is not really having many trees. As you can see from this map that shows above ground woody biomass relative to something I don't quite know. But really the entire middle America doesn't have many trees. Yeah. Can you say why that is? If I um personally, just like from my knowledge of that area of the United States, I would say it's because of all of the massive blocks of ice and glaciers that used to be over that area that kept on repeatedly receding and coming back. Which actually good question. I mean I don't know why, but I do know it made something really funny. So, because there's, like, no, this, like, it all, pretty much, it looked like this. This is native prairie grass in, like, uh, Oklahoma. So, basically, the entire middle America looked like this. And when it was being settled by Europeans in the something, 1840-something, man, I should probably know that, (laughs) um... (laughs) Because there's not much water, it's called the Great American Desert after all, and there's no trees to build stuff, um, they like pass through the region as quickly as possible and most likely died along the way. And they called it Poison Creek sometimes because it was not considered desirable. And because there weren't, weren't many settlers there, the Great Plains became one of the last bastions for Native Americans, and that's why that's where um, they were kind of pushed to. Oh, yeah. Uh, like Trail of Tears stuff, like Oklahoma, because the land really wasn't that valuable. But because the land wasn't that valuable, like the government gave it away just like in droves to um, railroad developers because it was cheap land. It was pretty flat. You could build through it really easily. And then people found out you could farm on it. And then people found out you could, water could come out of the freaking ground. And then farming boom. Because. This area has some insanely productive soil. Mm-hmm. It's very nice. We love our soil. We do. We don't want it to go into the ocean. It won't go in the ocean. I'm eating all of it. I love the taste of koi loam. I can't. I I cannot get enough of it. Can't you get like a parasite from eating dirt? Yeah, you can. What does dirt taste like? Um. You know how Oreos taste? Years of carbon. Uh You know how Oreos taste? Imagine like eating Oreos if you were sick. Eating Oreos if I had. When's the last time you've eaten dirt? Like a week ago. Oh, (laughs) what? What? I I repot plants a lot. And I think I had wings and it just kind of like. Very nice. I was very hungry. (laughs) Very nice. Okay. We're going to, we're going to move on from that. (laughs) So. Resident soil eater. This is reason number four why I hate Denver is because you can't even be content with living in Denver. The like the Rocky Mountains just want to throw stuff at you all the time because they hate Denver too. Stuff referring to large rocks and runoff. Yeah, because like no how many people don't really appreciate how butted up against the mountain Denver is. Because this is like a pretty these are the high plains. So you're already, like, about a mile above sea level, and from the Mississippi River, the landscape gradually, like, shifts up over, like, 700 miles. And once you get, like, here to this line and go up, the difference gets, like, thousands and thousands of feet. Yeah. So imagine a super big snowmelt coming down on a big slab of concrete. And you get this. Yeah. Yeah. Entire houses and factories and buildings just immersed. Yeah, the good thing Denver doesn't really have many suburbs and lots of concrete and poorly drained land, so for that to affect. <laughs> yeah, good thing there. Good thing Denver isn't just all suburbs 
Mm. It's I not like they had a bunch of cheap land to work with. The average um, height of a building in Denver is like 10 feet tall. <laughs> oh my god. Yep. So, you know, Rocky, Rocky Mountain, Snow Melt, there's a lot of it. And you, a lot of times it ends up going underground. Yeah. To the Ogallala. Og- Ogalal. I don't know how to pronounce it, but what I do know Ogallala. Is yeah, you got it the first time. Thank you. It's a super, like, really, really important aquifer that has basically no inflow. <laughs> hmm. um, it's kind of just there. And so after World War II, people started doing what's called center pivot irrigation. I will talk more about that, but it's, you know, it's a circle of farmland that has the big thing that goes in a circle. Oh yeah, that's why um that's, that's why, why a lot of farm plots in that area of um the United States are circles. Because it's all irrigation. It is you're not relying on rainfall at all. I always and wondered that. Twenty seven percent of irrigated land in the US is, uses the aquifer and it's about thirty percent of groundwater used for farming. And of course, because of that, um, this took about 2 million years to form, and we have, since 1950, it has been depleted by about 9%. 9 or 90? 9. Oh. I mean, that doesn't sound like a big deal, but where it's being used most here in southern Texas and Nebraska has some of the shallowest. Ooh, that's unfortunate. So, like, you know, you have more than, like, a thousand feet of thickness um, here in central Nebraska where it's not really being used at all. Um, yeah. Most of the decline is happening in Texas and it's making like farmland straight up inviable. That is, that's going to be a continuing issue. It seems it al- like. It also con- supplies um, drinking water, 2.3 million people. Oh no. <laughs> um, it seems like it's a continuing theme that uh, wherever water is, people often have much more of it than they really would practically need. Mm-hmm. Wherever water isn't, people need much more of it than they can practically distribute. Yeah, that's why, like, we'll talk about this in our world tour, but central China basically completely floods every year, not just because of climate change. Like, that's just what happens. I mean, obviously it's gotten worse, but, you know, they don't want any of that water anymore. <laughs> yeah. So we got into this a little bit, but a second Dust Bowl is very possible. Obviously, we've improved our farming techniques, but improved farming te- techniques can really only do so much if you have climate change. Yeah, so this it's, is. Go ahead. Um, the way we still farm, it's still very detrimental to our topsoil. We're still tearing up crops every single year and preventing those large roots and deep uh systems of roots from forming so you know dust is still getting kicked up but uh we just need to make sure that we're gonna how do I describe it i mean we just need to make sure that we're not going to be doing that at a, the rate we used to yeah so this is a uh, u.s drought monitor from probably the worst drought um in recent history the current drought is really only affecting much of the west coast and southwest this drought hit the great plains like really 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 hard um this was a dust storm that happened there and about 30 million acres in the corn belt lost all of its topsoil that's 30 million acres wow yeah that's a lot (laughs) that is a lot of acres that's uh I don't really have a size comparison for that, but that's a lot. I mean, that's probably what, like, some of New England. <laughs> that's uh, 46,000 square miles. Yeah. That's a lot. It was all of its nutrient-rich and carbon-rich topsoil, so the most important. Um, yeah, that's going to be incredibly detrimental. One-third of the Corn Belt. Imagine the entirety of Nicaragua having all of its top soil stripped away. How much farming are they doing in Nicaragua? But equivalents, you know. <laughs> I know, I'm just talking. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea. Yeah, that, that's, that wasn't good. Um, yeah, you know, things that do help 
um, you want to reduce evaporation. So mulching, um, windbreaks, so stuff like planting trees at the end of your plots really do help dust storms. Like they do that on like desert farmlands and then weed control, you know, conserving water. Uh, crop rotation is very good too because um, that one enriches the soil before your next crop and also helps keep the soil in place. Yeah. More so than that, stop wasting food. Absolutely. We, we, wouldn't we, we wouldn't have the need for all of this corn and all these soybeans if we weren't being so wasteful and depending so much on our various shapes of corn puffs. Yeah, if we're going to trash our planet uh, to make the food, let's eat the food. <laughs> yeah, so whatever that means to you, just eat it. Just eat the yeah. food. I don't care if you don't like it. Just eat it. You have to finish your... You have to finish your finish pudding your green before you can have before your Before you get dessert, yeah. <laughs> so this is center pivot irrigation. I talked about it a little bit more. And this is why all farmland west of the Mississippi River looks like this. Um, it's because when you don't have rainfall, you need to have a system that irrigates your water. So it's around a center pivot. with It looks like this. And it goes around in a circle. Um, drip irrigation is the holy grail of watering things. Then sprinkle. This is what center pivot irrigation uses. And as you can see, it's about 50% as efficient. I don't know, 50%. It's less efficient by a lot than drip yeah. irrigation, which is having very small dripping thing right next to your plant. So it's only getting the water it needs. And... Um, what all of these, including the Ogallala um, aquifer is using, is fossil water, which is, it's a non-renewable resource. You can literally consider that in the same bin as oil. And, like, center pivot irrigation sucks that water so fast because a lot of it's going into the atmosphere. Most of it's not even touching the plants at all. It's a few feet above that you're over-tapping those um, wells so much. And farmers have stopped using center pivot sometimes uh, because they can't afford the water anymore. It's getting so expensive to draw it out. Not just because we're, um, utilities are placing more regulations on well water, but because you need to have a bigger pump. You need to drill deeper. You need to... It's more energy intensive to draw out water as it becomes more scarce. Yeah, it's going to be um, incredibly interesting to see what's going to happen to farming in the West Mississippi once it becomes no longer you know financially viable to be pumping water from deeper wells to make more corn for your corn puffs that you throw out. Stop throwing out your corn puffs. I really should have put these slides in a different order because I'm going to talk about farmland migration soon. But it's fine. Texas farming. Um, it's not good. So People really farm in Texas? Remember this? Yeah. Not many people remember this, but when like Texas um ha got the that got the the Midwest special for a few days. <laughs> yeah, so Texas uh threw a bunch of climate change related weather mumbo jumbo that I don't really understand. Um literally pretty much the entire country got like really cold. And like Salt Lake City 36 degrees. Um Dallas Fort Worth 12 degrees, Tulsa, Oklahoma Four degrees, um, Mississippi. That's not Mississippi. Alabama, thirteen degrees. It was really cold everywhere, and you know, in Texas, I'm thinking of some of the things that went wrong. Um, yeah, all these buildings that that are in Texas that require power to be on at all times for their things to work. Um, paper thin insulation, paper thin walls, because they're not supposed. It's not supposed to get that cold. It's freaking Texas. And then um, Ted people... Cruz heading to Cancun on a flight. While yeah, it Ted was Cruz happening. went to Cancun. People froze to death in their sleep. Um, my favorite thing was about two years before this happened, Gavin Newsom, governor of California, tweeted, uh, you know, because California's rolling blackouts in the fall, um, he tweeted like, things that you can do to help conserve electricity during the day, like charging your electric car at night or various other things. And I, I shit you not, Greg Abbott, governor of Texas, tweeted, um, 
something like this is the power grid i'm gonna look this up because me trying to quote this would not do yeah, it justice. there was there was something about um the governor of texas wanting to transition to an independent power grid almost immediately before this was happening which ended up just exploding in their faces uh okay oh my god i i really do need to find this Uh, what was okay. it about? Gavin Newsom. It, 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 it was like to the extent of him saying, "Um, this is the power, like this is the power grid grid under Democrat control. They want to make this the standard for the." Oh, got it, got it. California is now. I'm sorry, it was Ted Cruz who tweeted this. California oh. is now unable to perform even basic functions of civilization, like having reliable electricity. Biden slash Harris slash AOC want to make California's failed energy policy the standard nationwide. Uh, this was tweeted August of 2020. Ooh, that aged like milk. <laughs> oh yeah, that aged terribly. Yeah, uh, Ted Cruz went to Cancun. Um, a lot of people died, and what happened is. There's an East Coast interconnect and a West Coast interconnect. So it might surprise you to know that pretty much the entire uh, East side of the continent is connected, including Canada. It's just easier to have everything on the same grid and then square up between the countries based on who's producing more. Um, and then the West Coast has its own interconnect. Usually it's west of the Rocky Mountains. Um, and Texas literally has its own third interconnect called ERCOT. And what ended up happening is, like, 10 years ago, there was a huge like, – there was something like this that happened, but it wasn't as bad at all. And they were like, okay, it's – like, that was – our grid is designed for a 50-year storm. That'll be fine. That was the 50-year storm. But if it gets any worse than that, we're in trouble. So they made no improvements to anything. Oh and my then god. They were like, and then climate change, you know, obviously with climate change, you know, a 50 year storm is definitely not becoming a 10 year storm. <laughs> and a 100 year storm is definitely not becoming a five year storm. Um, so that happened. Texas got wrecked. Pretty much all of its power went out, and they did ration power to the financial districts of city centers full of office buildings that no one was in because of covid yeah, and bad it, legislating on many parts it was bad texas got caught with his pants down and unfortunately a lot of people died and it was largely a political standoff i also love how florida still finds a way to be 83 degrees yeah right <laughs> and, and like of course the west coast is still a balmy 62 degrees yeah uh-huh but that also caused a lot of crop failures. Texas oh, yeah. can be known for year-round farming. Pretty much killed all of their crops. Big crop bust around that time, I remember. Mm -hmm. And cattle is basically what I like to call a turbo crop in that it requires just exponentially more resources than a regular crop. Um, that's going down as there's less water and feed to maintain the population. Yeah. And then this drought... This drought monitor report is the most cursed thing I've ever seen in my life. It's all red. That makes, like, California look like a a rainstorm. It's all red. That's terrible. Yeah. More crop failures. That's not very good. So, let's talk about the Mississippi River Basin. Um, it's big. Yes, it is. It's, it's most of the U.S., it's literally everything east of the Rocky Mountains. So the Mississippi River Basin is a like super low-lying stretch of land along this really southern stretch of the Mississippi River. And we might have showed this before, but this is what the U.S. might look like if more sea ice melted than could ever possibly melt. It's not really a good exercise to show what will actually happen, but it's, it's a hypothetical. It. It's worth it to show how low-lying the Mississippi River Basin is. Even something that's a few miles inland can be flooded. And it frequently floods whenever there's a hurricane, um, causing crop damage. Uh, one happened in 1993 that was about $12 billion. 
20% of the population's houses were destroyed in that area. And the Mississippi River on its own, like by its nature of draining such a large part of the U.S., is super prone to flooding when it gets wet anywhere. So lots of crops along the river have a bad time. Yeah, That one's not really related to the Great Lakes either, man. I haven't talked about the Great Lakes at all. Why is this the part two? It's fine. <laughs> it's, it's exploring water relation to the Great Lakes, you know? It certainly is. So this is worth talking about, and I, I, I sense I'm probably going to be here for a while. So right to repair, it's a movement that's been gaining traction for quite a while. Haha, <laughs> traction, we're talking about tools and farm equipment. <laughs> and essentially what it is is that uh, consumers have the right to determine who gets to fix their devices and that they have the right to documentation or and first party repair parts if they choose that repair technician to be themselves yeah and there's this guy on youtube his name is lewis rossman he can explain this whole predicament better than i can but pretty much john deere is a very big manufacturer of combines tractors um gators pretty much any farm equipment and if you look at something like this this combine it's big and it's probably really expensive this is a farmer's livelihood if this doesn't work they don't they don't get they don't get paid they don't get to make money yeah um so they're all of their software and parts are proprietary if you want if you live in the middle of nowhere and you want to get your um, tractor serviced, the only thing that John Deere expects you to do is to pay however many thousands of dollars to hire a huge truck to come out to your house, pick the combine up, and take it off to the dealer. And then it sits at the dealer for who knows how long, and then they might fix it, and then you need to pick it up with the same truck, bring it back, and by then your crop might have failed. So... What people are doing, there's a P, uh, Vice, Vice News does a piece on this, but farmers are finding like hacked versions of the software and fixing it themselves. Like they're finding hacked versions of the parts, pretty much pe what people do to their phones. Like, you know, they find a third party screen or something, but scaled up. Yeah. And you should care about this because, I mean, in the narrow sense, these, these tools are producing your food. Um, if these tools don't work, the American farming industry doesn't work. And you should also care because right to repair affects you personally. The laptop, you even if you don't fix stuff, like you don't know how to fix it, that's fine. But let's say my iPhone breaks and I I don't and let's say I didn't know how to fix it myself. <laughs> and I want to take it to I don't know, mom and pop repair store. And I want them to get good quality parts because Apple's like genius bar turnaround is too expensive and takes too long. I need my phone now. It's an important part of my life. Um, currently, if the mom and pop store tried to get parts, they would probably get a cease and desist from Apple. Yeah. And a law went into effect relatively recently that requires them to provide documentation two repair shops that they choose so they have a really orwellian like repair pro um, process for getting your shop certified it takes super long and you can get denied for literally any reason yeah so, and i mean going back to farming i feel like as a whole the farming industry has a lot of just horrible um monopoly practices going on you know mm -hmm. Monsanto exploiting the plant genetic resources of pretty much everything. And then uh, have you heard about um, Monsanto pollen blowing over to neighboring fields that don't use Monsanto soybeans? They get sued? Yep, they get sued because they find those Monsanto patented genomes in those soybeans. You done got sued because of natural wind and pollen. Are it's those, ridiculous. Don't they this make them like? Don't they make them like impotent anyway? Yeah. How does it even pollinate then? It's, it's because it mixes with um, other pollens. Okay. I mean, but like, yeah, they do deliberately um, 
destroy the uh, viability of those soybeans so that you can't save your crop from some season and then continue planting it next year. Yeah, and I mean, like, I'm pro-GMO. I think that GMOs are an important way to increase crop yields, um, reduce pesticide use, uh, make crops more resilient to diseases, all that. But it, it can't be a monopoly. The fact that Monsanto acquired Bayer, the literally the two most important thing like things like you eat pretty much everything you eat is a monsanto seed now yeah and it sucks monsanto i mean they're obviously not going to but if they say you know fuck it no more green beans then no more green beans (laughs) yeah yeah they, they they can control what food gets produced and it's all for profit. They, they, just, they, they have pretty much no oversight uh, because a lot of people don't realize how pressing the issue of like G- properly regulated GMOs are. Like They just want to say, no GMOs. GMOs are corrupting our planet or something. No. GMOs are going to help us out of this mess we made. Yeah. I yes. honestly do not understand why people just hate GMOs and the non-GMO There's project no is such a huge thing. Reason, I mean, if you ask those people why, they can't cough up a good reason. They they will not tell you why. It's so weird. But so as climate change does its thing, um, obviously we can't keep doing the same thing we're doing. And given the fact that agriculture is about makes up about thirty percent of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, that's when you factor in deforestation and post-production steps. Um, there's a few things that we can do to help reduce that impact. Uh, the first of which being solar farming. So as the sun gets more intense, you don't need, the crops really don't need as many physical hours of being in the direct sunlight. And if they were in the direct sunlight all day, it wouldn't be good for them. So having solar panels up reduces the impact on the crops and also helps power things yeah same same type of thing with forest farming although i don't really see it being as viable that's your it takes a lot more um it takes a lot more hands-on labor it's hard it's harder to um mechanize that might be a better family farm type of thing but you're just planting food in the forest um you know less direct sunlight and then terrace farming it's been around for thousands and thousands of years you can plant things in the terrace so that helps collect more rainwater for floodplain things like rice it also looks pretty cool yeah i don't think this photo is actually real it looks a little bit too high saturation it does i think it might have just been like a edited it looks a little edited it does but regardless it does get the terraced farming point across it does so whether we like it or not, farmland's changing. Um, yeah. Farmland that used to be viable isn't viable anymore, um, including Southern Central Valley of California. Anything that's in this bubble, I would consider it to be non-viable in the near future, uh, given how hot it's getting. But ironically, climate change is making farming easier in the north that is in such a way that it will reduce greenhouse gas emissions from farming. So climate change is making farming possible such that it'll reduce greenhouse gas emissions, which is kind of cool. Curious idea. So this is a line that shows agricultural viability in years. So this line's a bit hard to see, but it's the current agricultural viability. Um, In 2050... This could be it. You're opening up a lot more land of Alberta and Saskatchewan? Saskatchewan, yep. That's right. To farming. Um, a lot more high elevation farming. That doesn't really matter too much, but what does matter is that it's better land and Alaska too. So opening up more land to farming will not only like decrease the need for water, like over tapping wells, but it will also introduce more land for farming kind of at the same rate or faster than you're losing it yeah then also a curious observation um uh siberia having more viable land it'll be interesting to see how that pans out on um an economic term 
Yeah, a lot of people don't realize how forested and sparsely populated Russia is. Pretty much everything south of this line right here is forested. Sorry, yeah. what east of this line is forested. Um, and it's also, like, super deserted. Like, literally look at a map and go to uh, eastern Russia. There's nothing there. Yeah. It is weird. As soon as you go east of St. Petersburg, things just kind of start, like... Dissolving. Yeah. Yeah, Russia's interesting. I'd like to travel there um, if I don't have the threat of being abducted and used as a pawn in a foreign policy game. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, same thing with China. I'm like, I really want to travel to China when, like, I don't need to be worried about, like, being a political prisoner for... Now might not be the time. Xi Jinping <laughs> looks like Winnie the Pooh or something. <laughs> yeah, now might not be the time. Yeah, I don't know. Can, can, can the uh, democratic revolution happen soon so I can see pretty things in China? The general restriction for tourism is don't go to any place that has some sort of restriction on your uh, departure from that country? The cities, yeah, the cities are usually fine. It's when you go to the places where China's doing things they don't want you to see. It's um, like, um, when it becomes if you go to North problem. Korea, I don't know why you would, but if you go to North Korea, a lot of times the tour guide that you're assigned to will not let you leave Pyongyang, barring oh, yeah. only the best reasons. Uh-huh. Yes. Um... <laughs> Yeah, North Korea is one of the weird ones, too. I saw this documentary of people who, like, traveled to North Korea as, like, for a foreign policy thing. And it honestly felt like it, like Truman Show. Like, there were light shows going on in the city, and it honestly, like, really did feel like it was all because they were there. Yeah. Yeah. Authoritarian countries are weird. A lot of people give America flack, rightly so, but... It can be a lot. It could be a lot worse. <laughs> yeah, people always have this negative image of America, and then, I mean, I'm not sure how sold you are on the global happiness index. Personally, I'm I get, I take it with a few grains of salt, but we're I take it like with top a, twenty. Um, top twenty. Yeah, we're up there. Interesting. Who's first? Uh, some Scandinavian country. It changes most years. That's fair. I believe that. I mean, Sweden's a pretty place. But then you go there, and there's still, like, hideout Nazi families and stuff. This and year like, is Ooh. Finland. Man, then... imagine being, like, the Finland government, and you need to, like, compete with some other, like, stupidly named country. Yeah. <laughs> to try to figure out who gets the um, happiness index prize. We are number 19. That... 19, Crazy. okay. Yeah. What's that? What's what's the what's the most uh, relevant country that's ahead of us? The most relevant country ahead of us. Uh, UK is above us by two places. Canada is above us by six places. I believe and then that Germany is one above Canada. I mean, I believe Canada is higher because there's less people. <laughs> Pretty much, um, the top ten happiest countries are all the Scandinavian countries. Um, Austria and Australia and New Zealand. I oh, saw this Luxembourg. meme. I, I saw this meme and it was like a headline and it was heartbreaking. Child just wasted his cr critical period of language acquisition on Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like English if you were having a stroke. Mm -hmm. so that's all I have. Next episode, we're going to be talking about East Coast water policy. You cannot tell me which East Coast city this picture is from. Oh, it could be any question. one of them. It could be any one it, of them. It, like, honestly, uh, like, a extremely polluted river with, like, a, like a post-war industrial bridge behind it, and everything just looks gray. If I had to guess, how East Coast? Is it actually on the ocean? It is on the East Coast. Hmm. My first guess would have been Pittsburgh, but I have to say... It could be any Lake Erie, Lake Ontario, or East Coast north of Philadelphia city. Honestly. I'm putting my guess in as Boston. It's New York. Oh my god, really? Yeah. <laughs> it looks a little bit, um... 
that's was built up. It I feel looks like a little look- too. It looks a little too New Englandy. It looks kind of like when people take photos of the Great Pyramids of Giza, and it's like, wow, look at them. They're in the middle of the desert, and then you turn the camera angle and around, and you just see, like, Cairo. <laughs> yeah. I bet if you, if you turn the camera angle around, and I saw, like, you know, all of New York, it'd, pretty, it'd be immediately obvious, but... Imagine living in Cairo, and that's just part of the skyline. You're just like... Yeah. Cool. On a queer day, I can see the... Uh, Sears Tower outside my bedroom window. On a clear day, I can see the Sears Tower and whatever other weird buildings are in Chicago. There's a lot of weird buildings. I have no idea what's in Chicago. I don't go very much. I don't. Do you know how much like abandoned rail tunnels there are in Chicago? There's a there's a great deal of them. We Chicago, used to be a railroad town and we still are, but not nearly to the group. We're not a, an urban be. railroad town anymore. All of the um Rail yards are in poor neighborhoods that got bulldozed by eminent domain. <laughs> it's the same ones that the interstate highways cross over. Pretty much. But, yeah, like, there's, I mean, now, like, they pretty much only serve as homeless shelters. But, like, people walk around there, and it's, like, big rail tunnels, and they're everywhere. Yeah. It's weird. All right, any shout-outs before we go? Uh, for this week, I don't think so. I don't. Shout out to this bomb ass hot shot.